send people from all around the world to you all around the world. Uh, in fact, I was saying yesterday that SIM are currently looking at Britain as a mission thing. So, but I uh, recently spent some time, I'm a Bible translator and church planter, and I was asked to do some Greek check, Greek language check for some translations in the country of Niger. Uh, the Republic du Niger, as it is officially known, some people would call it Niger. It is, as you can see, just north, just north of Nigeria, and east of Mali, and west of uh, Chad. It is uh, the large country in West Africa, and uh, it would be fitting this morning if I gave you a truly Nigerian greeting. So, bonjour, bonjour de Dieu. Hello in God's name. Uh, or I could also greet you a typical house of greeting. Salu, inakwana. No? <laughs> I was just asking you, how, how was your getting up this morning? Uh, so, where is Niger? Well, Niger is uh, sub Saharan, but encroaches on the Saharan desert. It is, as you can see, mostly brown. Um, except for about three months a year when <coughs> this portion of the country, just in the south, this band across the south, goes green during the rainy seasons. But as you can see, I was working in Marathi in south central Niger, and in Niamey, the capital of Niger. I was there for a short, well, a reasonably short time in missionary terms but long enough uh, to get us on time. <laughs> the population of Niger are primarily Islamic. Uh, as you can see, 97% Islamic. Uh, the remaining 3% would be mostly animistic and ancestor worship of that kind of thing. An evangelical population of around 0.1%, but I would say that's probably being a little bit generous. show you a reasonably common sight in the street in Niger. Here's a typical uh, street in Niamey. This would be quite a, a main road through the city. Uh, and this is the kind of thing you would see on that road quite frequently. Um, this kind of thing also. This would be maybe the equivalent of going down one of the main streets of Manchester and a herd of cattle just decided to trot through followed by a, a, a man with a sword. Usually about um, You get your revenge on these traffic blockages <laughs> when you get them in your own mood. <laughs> but I'll show you some, some other things that you see in Africa. Just so you, can, you can get an idea of the context of Niger. Uh, this is a man digging a well. He's 40, about 40 feet down. He probably has another 40 feet to go. Um, he just passed down in a little pocket. And that is probably one job that I would not want. <laughs> I don't think he particularly wants it either. But, uh, one of the smaller uh, creatures you'll find at night. Um, you walk quickly in Niger for fear of snakes, camel spiders, which are about that size. Camel spiders are called camel spiders because the locals believe that that scorpions ride on the back of them. Uh, they're also called a scorpion's horse. A very encouraging name, very large fangs. Um, scorpions that you find in the country, the death stalker scorpion, an encouraging name. Uh, the emperor scorpion, uh, which has the one of the most lethal snakes in the world. Uh, typical form of transport uh, for, for a man who's 19 stone is a 50cc moped with a welding uh, machine strapped to the back. Uh, I was warned, don't drop it, and was handed a bungee cord to, to secure it to the back of the bike. Quite a challenge on bumpy roads. Here's something quite common, getting stuck behind the local bread delivery guy. 
He couldn't see me, and I'm pretty sure he was ignoring the sound of the car behind him. Uh, but he eventually got out of the way. Uh, there's somebody else, you see, a bush taxi. There's probably about 40 people piled into the back of that small Peugeot truck. Health and safety is not a concern. Um, it's, that's quite a common sight. You'll see those all the time. Uh, your typical good lunch, when there's good street vendors about, you can get a, a decent lunch of couscous and onions and uh, peanut curry powder. And perhaps something would be less desirable. Um, it looks appetizing until you start to look a little bit closer at how it's made up. That is goat brain. Um, and it actually tastes very nice. But I always thought, I was under the impression that goat brain would have been a soft meat. Surprisingly chewy. <laughs> that goat obviously did quite a lot of thinking. Here's a chicken that I was describing yesterday. A chicken with a tumour. Uh, you can't be picky about your food. If your chicken has some form of cancer, you just go ahead and eat it. Uh, this is a picture I've been telling some people about. I was doing some evangelism with, um, with some Tuareg men, uh, Tamandric people. Uh, here they are making they make rings and other jewellery out of raw silver. And as I'm sitting there, maybe eight hours in, this gentleman on the top right comes in and sits down and he's dressed really very well in these jerry and standards. Uh, and I, I went to take his picture and he said, no pictures, I'm a political man. So I took his picture anyway and but it stood very discreetly. A few hours later I discovered why he didn't want me to take his picture and why he was a political man. That man is, a, is one of the commanders in Al-Qaeda in Niger. And as it turned out, the other men who were around me were all uh, attached to Al-Qaeda in some way. There was a, um, they were quite proud of this actually. Uh, but they still wanted to hear the Bible story, which is encouraging. Something else you'll see very commonly in Niger. Uh, people riding camels. I, I, I was under the impression that they didn't really do this very much now. They do. Not only do they ride around camels, but you can see a sort of a silver line underneath him. That's a sword. It's quite common that people will still carry swords around the country. Um, how can we, I wonder how we would take that if people started doing it here. But I was there from the 25th of May until the 23rd of August. I had a 90 day visa, how did I get all of my work done in that 90 days? So why was I there? My missionary intention of focus was Bible translation and tribal church plan. And that's my primary concern. Applied linguistics, uh, phonetics and phonemics, how we, how we form our language and how we say it, and the Greek exegesis. I had to look at the Greek text and see if the, the translation was being uh, faithful or accurate in, in terms of how they were translating it from the Greek. Um, I also um, had to fulfill some practical ministry. Um, I was a project engineer at a demonstration farm that the, that the mission run as a, as, a, as a means of evangelism. They run a demonstration farm and invite groups of farmers to come along and learn farming techniques. And as part of that day, they also must hear the gospel. Time was, was split up like that, I'm not hanging on that too, too long, but you can just see that there was a, a balance of translation work alongside practical work. Like you don't just go and do the practical work in the morning, or go and teach a Bible lesson, creation to Christ lesson, um, and then fulfill the day's work and then teach another lesson, sometimes at night. But who are the kind of people that you're working with? Well, I was, working, I was working for Bible translators doing my Greek check in Marani and Niamey and uh, 
working in the languages of Western Fulani, Eastern Fulani, um, and Manga, also called Kanuri. Why do you do this? Well, the Christians need Bibles. <laughs> I would, how, what are, how would you manage your Christian life if you didn't have your Bible? Well, the fact is that the vast majority of the world's Christians do not have a Bible that they can read in their own language. That's unacceptable. And it must change. And so that's why translators exist. So I want to thank some of the people groups that are in these here. There's more people groups than I'll show you here, but um, this is just an example. The, the Fafuli people, or the Fulani, are a nomadic tribe group that they run from around with Gambia, across Africa, into Sudan. Uh, you'll, find, you'll even find some in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, they're nomadic people, and they travel back and forth. Um, usually, if you see a herd of cattle, it is a, a fulfilled person who is guiding them. They are folk Islamic, uh, usually. The house of people um, who are also found in Nigeria um, and in Burkina Faso are primarily Islamic and of course they influenced very heavily by Boko Haram. The House of People are Northern Nigerian and Southern Nigerian. Um, it would be very common when speaking to a House of Person that they would be quite militant against Christianity um, because of that Boko Haram influence. The Manga people uh, from uh, the east of Niger are folk Islamic. Primarily. The Gurma people are animistic, ancestor worship, and Roman Catholic. Uh, they are in the far southwest of the country where the, where the Catholic Church, that's the only Catholic church I encountered in the country. Um, but that was the, the influence of Burkina Faso. Zerma are Islamic. Not, not in a folk sense, in quite the same way, they are quite strictly traditional Islamic. And Tamajic are Islamic. They're from the north, they, they cover that sort of the desert region of the country. Um, and they are influenced very heavily by Al Qaeda. Here we can see this is the, um, the same group that I was showing you earlier on a different occasion. The fellow in the, in the hat is um, a guy called Phil Batchelder. He's a, 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 an Alaskan missionary working in Niger. And he, he what we call a contextual missionary. He will try his best to be as much like the people as possible. And he's very successful at it. He can speak the language fluently. And, even his intonation and his accent would lead people to think he was Nigerian. In fact, people would say that he is Nigerian. Something very, a very common sight in any Islamic country are mosques. Mosques have a fairly uniform look about them. There's a lot of money to put forward for the building of mosques, and so they're everywhere. Absolutely. Everywhere. Small mosques and big mosques with big loudspeakers, if you can see the loudspeakers at the top right, that blast across the city for the prayers. Some are also more ornate than others, but uh, and have smaller loudspeakers. But thankfully, and praise God, there is a church. Church of Jesus Christ is in Niger, and it's growing. The church is seeing people want for Christ, and I want to show you one of the most amazing sites that I saw in Niger. A church that had been established for only a couple of years, an Assemblies of God church, and the church that I had attached myself to while I was in the rally. What a remarkable sight. It's a but this side is no, no less remarkable than if we were to take everyone out here and take a picture of them all. The church gathered together. We would see people redeemed by Christ. 
I can show you similar pictures from all around the world of people redeemed by Christ. But this is remarkable. Isn't it? Yeah. What an amazing sight to see. People won for Christ. One from Islam, one from animism, one for Christ and by Christ. Here's another testimony of, an amazing testimony of hope. The man in the middle was an Islamic missionary. Wow. He is now a Christian missionary. This man, Abdul, he, the book that he has in his hand is an Arabic copy of the Gospel of Luke. And he was, he just walked out of the middle of nowhere. I was told about this man on one occasion, and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to meet him? But I was out for a walk with the two missionaries on either side of him. But we're just out for a walk, and out of nowhere, out of the bush, walks up to him. There were no houses around him, right in the middle of nowhere. He just walks out, and it was just an appointment of God. And uh, I just wanted to relate, relate some of his story. A man won by Christ and for Christ, serving Christ. A, a, a local man, a national man, who is fervent in proclaiming the gospel of Christ. I took on some practical ministry, but it was it, practical ministry it must always be a means to an end. Being a doctor in a, in a foreign country does not make you a missionary. You're a missionary when you're preaching the gospel of Christ. Evangelizing. You're not, if you're giving out food aid in a, in a foreign country, but you do not speak for Christ, you have to break it. You, you have not been a missionary. You're only a missionary when you are witnessing for Christ. So I use the practical ministry as a means to relate the gospel to the people that I was working with. Working men, I was able to give a creation to Christ course across 12 mornings. Some of those men had never heard of Christ before. Here are some of those men. The two men you can see, the one in the yellow and black shirt and the one in the red outfit um, were Muslims. Um, and the other three men in the picture are Christian. But those Muslim men must come every morning of their work to a Bible reading and prayer meeting. So they're exposed to the gospel every single day. It's a bit like stepping back in time, in time at times, and when you go to some places in Africa, they have a lot of land and they have to do it by hand, and that's the kind of thing they're farming, basically sand. Uh, I'll just show you this. Uh, we, have, we held a course on the, on the agricultural farm, on the demonstration farm, to bring men in uh, and teach them farming skills. But at that course, we decided to show in the house of language the Jesus film, um, which is a helpful tool. It's a tool only uh, in order to, to show them things that they wouldn't otherwise ever have understood or seen in the context of Israel and so on. What you can't really see very clearly in this room uh, are 40 men sitting watching the Jesus film who have never heard of Christ before. Men who have come from all around the country to learn farming skills. We invited them to this evening and they all came. One man got extremely angry and stormed out, but uh, he came back in with his head held low and he came back and sat down in the seat and finished the film. To be encouraged, there is a hunger for Christ. Here's a man who stood outside for the two hours because he didn't want people to see him watching the film. But I managed to follow through the window. He stood there for two hours to watch the film outside. I finally got my transport graded and uh, I won't beat up to the Hilux. a few scenes from the country. Here's a man with a leg with a pair of jeans on his head. Because that's, because that's the kind of thing that you see. And here are some of the men and myself. Uh, 
uh, from the demonstration farm. The man with the number 11 on his shirt um, took issue with me because I was telling him the gospel every day. Uh, he fell out with me quite badly. He wasn't a Christian. And during my time there, um, he, he was told that he had to take anything that needed repaired, he had to bring it to me. So he quite bashfully brought me his sprayer, his crop sprayer, and I fixed it for him. And from that point on, he was attentive. I wouldn't say friendly, but he was certainly attentive. But by the time I left, he, uh, in typical Nigerian style, he came up and took my hand on my wrist and uh, I said, just said thank you. I've heard since then that he has committed his life to Christ. Praise God. The great opportunities come uh, at the end of my Creation to Christ sessions with the men. Uh, they invited their families, probably because they thought I was going to, I was going to provide food. Uh, I didn't, but they invited their families, and so when I expected there to be about 12 or 13 men there to hear, there were maybe a hundred children, small children, all the way through, all the family, the wife, their wives as well, uh, come. And I had to change what I was going to say on the spot because what I was going to say wouldn't have been appropriate. But I told them the story of the conversion of Saul, a very important story if you're trying to relate to, to, to Muslims. The conversion of Saul is very helpful to show somebody who was an antagonistic and persecuted the Christian church, but was confronted by Christ. And that's what I was stressing, that it was not simply the people of Christ that they had to contend with, it was Christ himself. But it reminded me of this, preach the word, be ready in season, and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with great patience and instruction. I, I prefer, personally I prefer the King James there, be instant. Be instant. Yeah, like that. If somebody needs to hear the gospel, you be instant. You get in there and tell them. Working Bible translation, I call it a distressing blessing because part of my job required that I find the issues in the translation. So I worked directly with the East Fulani team on the check of Revelation. I was asked to check the West fully because of grave concerns, um, where they had, for example, removed the name, I think the words, the Son of God, for fear of offending Muslims. That has been correct. That is not acceptable. I also worked directly with the Manga team. They were in the middle of, a, of, a, uh, of revising the New Testament because it had been discovered that, that, that their translation was was wrong. So they were in the middle of revising it and they were doing a wonderful job at it. Here's an example of that West Petroleum translation that had some issues. I wanted to show you this. Um, of course you don't all understand uh, the problem there. Um, I'll, I'll go through it. In their cut and go in, even Kala, don't go hori home. Either in Guri de Romijo, Ala Mwaro, Go to Do No Jodi, Yamo, Ala Jom, Wad, Et the Dungo. Here's how you, you would back translate it. How, this is the English that you would develop from that. In what we're saying, this is more, we have the Imam, God, the Great One, who is above, sitting on the right hand of God. The one who possesses power and glory. Now, if you know Hebrews 8, verse 1 at all, uh, don't be afraid to look it up. We have a great high priest. The translation team that we're working on, the rest of the week, found it appropriate to translate high priest, the great high priest, a reference to Christ as the Imam. Anybody familiar with Islam will know that the Imam is the Islamic teacher. That is not an acceptable translation. 
That is not the kind of thing that well, should be allowed to go, to go into our Bible, the Bible translations around the world. There is a philosophy within a certain translation organization that permits this kind of nonsense. SIN does not. We are very strict on key terms such as high priest. The language has a word for high priest. They don't need to use the word for original teaching. So the translation has been corrected. And a, an individual called Pierre Barbesson has been tasked as the translation coordinator for Niger now to make sure that this kind of thing isn't going on. We, SIN refuses to print such a thing because it is a front against God and his word. But it's all about building relationships. That is what any evangelism is. It's building relationships. It is relating the gospel of Christ because we have not only a bonus to do so, but also an ability to do so. We come alongside people and tell them the gospel. But this is what Bible translation is all about. It's putting the truth of God in the language and form that people can understand. Because the Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, is a very serious task, and one that I'm very proud to be a part of, and one that I am so looking forward to being a part of in the future. We are all involved in God's mission. Some go and live sacrificially. Some stay and live sacrificially. But all must pray sacrificially. We must have a sacrificial lifestyle toward God. We give ourselves to Him. That's what Holiness says. It is a set apart in this for God. It is setting ourselves aside for His service. Living to Him and enjoying Him. So what does the future hold? Well, Niger have asked us to come back. But we feel that God is leading us to somewhere else. My fiance and I will be married next year. Uh, we will be giving ourselves a long-term service, uh, going to one field and staying there. We've been asked to look at Pakistan. We feel that God is calling us there. To that end, I'm going on an investigative trip for six weeks uh, this year. I'll be visiting the northern region of Kohistan and Gilgit, Pakistan. Uh, to look at how possible it would be to plant churches and translate the Bible in that area. Uh, 